All right, guys, we are back in the book of James. As you can tell, I'm in my office this week, which means I got the mask on my neck. This is as close to a beard as I'll probably ever get. Um, but we're going to be in James uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Uh, and we'll be looking at um, what we'll call Christian impartiality, um, which basically means not showing fav favoritism to a certain person, as we'll see. Uh, we'll see that in the study, so we don't need to describe it in great detail right now. Uh, but we'll look at Christian impartiality. We could also call it just Christian love. Christian love, and we'll see, we'll see how those two tie together in our study. Um, but I want to go ahead and pray for us, and then I'll read the passage, and then we'll begin our study. All right? So, uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we pray that your word would go so deeply into our hearts, minds, and souls that we would be changed. Lord, we pray these things for Christ's glory and for his sake. Amen. Last week, we saw that James wants us in our Christian religion to not only hear the word, but to do the word. That James wants us not only to receive the word humbly, which he does, he wants us to do that. But he also wants us to react to the word habitually, right? Hear the word, do the word. That's what James wants for us. That is what defines the Christian religion. Hearing the word of Christ, believing it, and doing it, right? And we saw last week in verses 26 through 27 of chapter 1, where James says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not brittle or bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. What's interesting there is that James describes religion that is pure and undefiled before God as relating to people correctly, right? Christian religion in its essence involves relationships with other human beings, right? Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It involves human relationships, Loving one another, right? That's the great commandment. Well, James continues this theme in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, and I'll go ahead and read all of those. Hopefully you'll be able to see the connection as we read. He says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay, pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil, evil thoughts? You see the, the, the tie-in there of caring for the poor, caring for the less than. It's kind of the same tie-in as verse 27 uh, in chapter 1, where we're visiting the orphans and widows in their affliction. So you're visiting and relating to well the afflicted, right? Same thing kind of here with the poor man. Listen in verse 5, he says, of chapter 2, My beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the, the rich the ones who oppress you and drag you into court, or not, are, they, are, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable, honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, quote, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality or favoritism, I'll use those words interchangeably, 
You are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressions, transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of the law. For he who said, quote, do not commit adultery, end quote, also said, quote, do not murder, end quote. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we'll look at this uh, text in kind of two different parts. First, we'll look at the command for impartiality. Remember, we're, we're labeling this, this uh, lesson Christian impartiality. So we'll look at the command for impartiality. Uh, and then we'll look at the reasons for impartiality. Okay? So first, the command for impartiality. It's in verse 1. It's very plain, very distinct. James says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Very simple command. Uh, show no partiality. Or show no favoritism. Uh, that phrase, partiality, uh, literally means to receive the face. Right? So James is saying, don't receive someone's face. And that means basically to look at someone and based on their outward appearance, judge them based on what you see at the surface. And James says, don't do that. Now, we have to be clear, we should judge someone based on what we see on the outside, right? Jesus said, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then 1 John says this, if anyone says he loves God, but does not love the brethren, that man is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So how could John make such a judgment if he if he couldn't judge people for what he saw on the outside? Well, he could, to a degree. right? Jesus, even when he said, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, he's saying, what you see on the outside of a per on a person is somewhat indicative of what's on their heart. Right? So in one sense, we should judge people on the continual habitual outward patterns of their lives. Uh, the qualities that continually manifest themselves in the life of another person. Right? We should judge uh, someone in that way. We'll get a pretty good idea of what's on the inside of a person by what's on the outside of a person. But James doesn't say don't ever judge, right? Or don't ever judge by what you see on the outside. He doesn't say that. He says don't favor or not favor a person based on merely their appearance, right? Merely their skin color, merely their hair color, merely their clothes or their wealth or their cleanliness or their health or their style or their teeth or their car or their house or so on and so on and so on. That's where the sin of favoritism shows up, where you are partial to a certain people or people group based on only what they what they look like, or what they smell like, or what kind of car they drive, and those types of, of things. And obviously this is a pretty appropriate uh, text and exhortation from James for our world today. Recently our news feeds and headlines uh, have been bombarded with pleas for people to not show favoritism uh, or lack thereof because of this, the, the outward appearance of race or of ethnicity. And while those pleas can certainly be helpful to us in so much as they are biblical, I believe the church desperately needs to realize that our impartiality in the church is not dictated by the latest news feeds and headlines. Our impartiality as the church is dictated by God alone in His Word alone. Christians are not to be impartial because CNN or Fox News or Twitter or Instagram tells us to be impartial. And we're not to jump on board of the impartiality train just because everyone else is doing it in this hashtag culture that we live in. We should already be on the impartiality train. We should already be beating harder than anybody else, the impartiality drum, because we know precisely and exactly what God says about the sin of partiality in all forms in His Word. Based on what I've seen, 
in our hashtag and headlines culture, it seems like a lot of people are just beating the impartiality drum and riding the impartiality train because something happened in Minneapolis and the media went into a frenzy. Right? And what's happened is Christians are being, whoa, tossed over here. Whoa, impartiality. Whoa, we need to get on this train. But the church ought to be steady. When all of this happens, you know what the church needs to do? We just need to be obedient. We already know we shouldn't be impartial. We should just be living that out. Ephesians 4 tells us that we are to no longer be children tossed to and fro by the ways and carried about by every wind of doctrine and human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes or political schemes or CNN or Fox News or Twitter or Instagram. We ought to be right down the middle, steady. When the world is in a frenzy, the church should just be steadily loving her neighbor as herself. We don't need hashtags and headlines. We need obedience. We need to be living out what we already know we should be living out. Our obedience is not dictated by Fox News. Our obedience is not dictated by the death of George Floyd. We grieve and we pray and we love our neighbor because that's what we're already supposed to do. So if you feel like you struggle with being partial to a certain skin color or outward appearance or wealth status or hair color or so on and so on and so on, confess it to one of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Confess it to me. We're here to help you. What I've seen as a result of all of this stuff going on in our culture is the church, man, we are just bashing people when we're supposed to help people. We say all the time Christ's love is for every depth of sin. Well, Christ's love is also for the racist then. Are we ready to receive that person? Should there be a racist somewhere in our midst in America? Are we ready to receive them? and help disciple them with the love of Christ? Or are we only there to shun them with hell, fire, and brimstone that we would normally condemn, but it seems to fly out of our mouths so easily nowadays? If you feel like you don't struggle with being partial to outward appearance, then I would say to you, continue being faithful to love all people and be wary of hidden sins in our lives. Sometimes we think we're okay and we're not really okay. Get people to look into your lives and say, actually I do see a sin of partiality towards a certain skin color or smell or lack thereof or wealth status or school that they go to or music that they like. I do see a partiality there. It's the command for impartiality. It's pretty simple. Show no partiality as you hold the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And the reason I brought up all that stuff about how uh, CNN and Fox and Twitter and all these things don't dictate our impartiality as Christians is because, G is because James says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. It is baked into our faith to not be partial. Christ dictates our impartiality, not Tucker Carlson or Fox News or CNN or Instagram or black pictures all over our social media feeds. Christ, this, this idea was Christ's far before it was our culture's idea. And so we need to go back to what Christ has said. Drown out all of the noise around you and pick this up. And stare in the face, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, and see if there's a hint of partiality in you towards any outward appearance. And seek to get it out of your, out of your life. That's the command for impartiality.
Now we look at the reasons for impartiality. James goes into this in verses 2 through 13. Uh, he says, For if a man wearing a gold ring, so he says, Show no partiality for, or because, if a, if a man uh, wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing comes in, uh, and if you pay attention to the to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. That's the example that he gives, right? He gives us an example before he gives us the reasons, okay? And James is saying, here's the scenario. You have paid attention to the rich man, but you have shunned the poor man. He says to them, you have made decisions to honor or not honor based on merely outward appearance by receiving the face just like I'm telling you not to do in verse 1 you notice he says that they have they've honored the one with the gold ring and the fine clothing and the shabby clothes guy they have shunned and they've said sit over there sit under the footstool and we know this is a church assembly uh, the, the Greek word here is used for it's, it's synagogue so it shows you kind of how early James is writing they're in a synagogue here. Um, maybe the people, the, the rich man and the poor man, maybe they're visitors, maybe they're new believers. Uh, it seems that they're visitors um, because they have to be shown where to sit. Uh, as as the, the ushers seem to be telling the poor man, you sit over here and you sit over there. You know, It's kind of like an ushering situation. Uh, but the point is, they have treated with partiality. And James's point is that you should not show partiality Verse 4, because of the position of man. Verse 1, show no partiality. Verse 4, he's giving you his first reason. Verses 2 to 3 gives you an example of the situation that's going on in the church. And verse 4, he hits you with the first reason to not show partiality. And he says, you should not show impartiality because you are not God. That's why. Verse 4, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James is saying, this is not your place to judge in the manner that you're judging. It's not in your job description as a believer. It's in God's job description. He's in the position to judge. You're not. It's not your position to judge people and treat them based on what you see on the outside. It's your position to love them and treat them with dignity, humility, love, and grace and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the believer's job description. I heard a story recently about Gandhi, uh, the, the famous Hindu. Um, he wrote in his autobiography uh, that during his student days, he read the gospel seriously, uh, and he considered becoming a Christian. He believed that in the teaching of Jesus, uh, he could find a solution to the hereditary ranks of profession or wealth. In other words, he, he believed he could find a solution to, to the partiality that, that he found in the world in, uh, in, in India, where he lived. And so one Sunday he decided to attend uh, services at a nearby church, and he talked to the minister about becoming a Christian. But when Gandhi entered the sanctuary... Here's what happened. The usher at the church refused to give Gandhi a seat and suggested that Gandhi, quote, go worship with his own people. Gandhi left the church and never returned. And Gandhi wrote this. He said, quote, if Christians have partiality and differences of hereditary rank of profession and wealth and nationality, if they show partiality just like the world also, I might as well remain a Hindu. James says, that is evil. James says, that man, that day, and the people in the example that James has already given us in, in James chapter 2, verses 3, have become judges with evil thoughts. It's not just bad hospitality. It's evil. 
And he says that is not our position. That's the first reason, position of man. Second reason is the plan of God. So why, why do you not show partiality and why do you show impartiality? Why do you not play favorites? Because of the position of man and because of the plan of God. Look at James chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. Uh, he says, listen, my beloved brothers. And I love when James calls us to listen. Listen, my beloved brothers. James cares. If you read this letter, James is harsh. And he's bold. And he commands a lot. But he does all of those things because he cares deeply for us. He is like a pastor. If people ever come up to you and are pretty harsh and bold, before you go and run off and tell people how harsh or bold they were to you and how apparently ungracious and unloving they were to you, ask yourself this question. Why are they doing that? Could it be they are doing this because they care more deeply than anyone else for me? Because no one else will tell me these things. Could it be? It is for James, Pastor James here. He says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? In other words, don't you know God's perennial plan of salvation and saving grace? Don't you know how God works? God didn't show favoritism to the rich in his sovereign election, did he? And therefore, neither should you. God didn't show partiality when he, quote, from Ephesians 1, chose his people in him before the foundation of the world, did he? No, he didn't. And James is saying, well, then neither should you. The Bible actually teaches us that you and me were the poor man before God, and yet God still chose us. The Bible tells us that we were the beggar. We were the smelly one, smellier than any other poor person we'll ever meet in this earth. And yet God chose us. If God in his sovereign electing grace would have shown the favoritism toward the rich and the powerful and attractive that we so often show to those people around us, we would have never been saved. There is more than meets the eye to a lot of people that we see based on their outward appearance. We could be if we oppose the poor man, we could be neglecting the very person that God has not neglected. I think it's a proper parallel, proper illustration. The Pharisees and the Judaizers, at the time of Jesus, they rejected Jesus because he was poor and lowly. He was no one to look at. He didn't have a home. They rejected him. But God did not reject his son. He vindicated him in resurrection. Um, the Jews were found guilty of rejecting somebody that very much so God had not rejected his only son. So may we not be found that way. May we not be found that way. James says, God has not neglected the poor man, but you... This is a killer, killer phrase here. This, I mean, this would just have to cut their hearts wide open. Verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man. James is essentially saying God hasn't done it, but you have. You're, you're in the position of opposing God right there. And that is, to put it lightly, that is not where we want to be. So we don't, we don't uh, show partiality because we don't want to play God. We're not in his position. Um, and also because it's a manifestation that we don't really know God's plan of salvation. God has chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. So may we not neglect them on this earth. Uh, next, the practicality of the situation. So we don't want to show partiality because of uh, the position of man the plan of God and the practicality of the situation here. Now, this is, a, this is an argument of logic that James makes. Uh, it's really, really a simple argument. James in chapter 2, verse 6 says, uh, this is the second half of chapter, or verse 6. He says, Are not the rich the ones who oppress you uh, and the ones who drag you into court? So 
So James, simple argument. He's saying, why are you showing partiality to these people? Why are you honoring them so much and giving them the best seats? They're dragging you into court, they're oppressing you, and they're the ones that are blaspheming not only you, but the honorable name of Christ to which you have been called. James's point here is it just makes no sense. Look at, look, look at the situation you're in, the practicality of the situation. Why are you honoring these people? Now, of course, we want to honor those who even, uh, to a degree, who even uh, oppose us and persecute us and all of that. We see that certainly in the New Testament. But James is just making the point here. They're oppressing you. Why are you showing so much partiality to them? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Next we see we don't want to show partiality because of the pronouncements of Scripture. Because of the pronouncements of Scripture. James says in verse uh, verse 8, he says, If you really feel that fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, quote, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, end quote, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So James's point here is that the Scripture is pronouncing judgment on you if you show partiality or preference to a particular people, group, or person because of what you see on the outside. That's James's point. The Scripture is pronouncing judgment on you if you show partiality. Now there's some discussion about what the phrase is royal law in verse 8 means and then law in verse 9 means. Uh, I really don't think this is a big deal. We don't need to spend much time on it. Some people think it refers to the Old Testament law. Some people think it refers to the whole law of Scripture as seen through the person and work of Christ. I think that section option is better. Uh, and I think the best way to think about it is like this. The whole of Scripture teaches us to, quote, love our neighbor as ourselves, right? The Old Testament taught it, Leviticus 19.18, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus in the New Testament reiterates this in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. We know this first. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. So he covers all the bases there. This commandment is all throughout Scripture, right? All the law and prophets depend on love the Lord your God with all your, your heart, soul, and mind, and Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what James means, I think, with the phrases royal law and law. Um, the whole of Scripture is teaching this. It is clearly the way of God and the way of Christ and the kingdom. And therefore, it is royal. And James's point is favoritism and uh, partiality based on outward uh, appearances compromises that law. You are judged by the scriptures as a whole if you violate this command to love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10 he says, forever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. So if you are if you show partiality and you're convicted and uh, you are convicted and judged not just by the command to love your neighbor, but you're convicted and judged by the entire word of God because it's all summed up in that one phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. Breaking that commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, breaks all of the commandments. He says, for he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Uh, if you do not commit adultery but do murder, you become a transgression of the law. And I think it's interesting here to note that the reason we become transgressors of all of the law if we disobey one part of it is because of who gave the law, right? These are not just isolated commandments that came from just random places. They all came from God. And so if we disobey one, who are we disobeying? The commandment? Well, yeah, in a sense. But we're disobeying God, ultimately. And if we've offended Him in one, if we've offended him in one point, we've offended Him as a person. And because of who he is, that dude, that deserves judgment. That's what James's point is here. He says, for he who said, that's God, for he who said do not commit adultery, also said do not murder. God gave all the commandments. So if we break one, we are, we are transgressing against him. Even more so, kind of, if you want to think of it this way, even more so than just the commandment itself. Because the commandment is a reflection of who God is. And when we disobey, we're opposing him. That's really what it comes down to. 
So James says, so speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Now it's important to note that we will not be judged for our sins in Christ. Right? Those are, those are put away in the depths of the sea and we are accepted before God. But we will be judged for our good works or lack thereof. So James says, let the reality of that coming judgment for your works in Christ, let that reality of that judgment change the way you treat people today. <laughs> Go visit the orphans and the widows and honor the poor man. Because judgment is coming for those of us who are in Christ. Um, just interesting to think about today. How often do you think of the, coven, the coming judgment of Christ for your good deeds? I don't think we think about that very much in the Christian life. A lot of times we think we're just not going to be judged. I mean, there's a theology out there that it's just nowhere to be found. We're not going to be judged by Christ because we're gracious and forgiven and all that. Well, yeah, we have grace and forgiveness. Our sins will not be counted against us, but our, we will be good judged for our good deeds. And we'll have rewards for our good deeds. And so that should change the way that we live. We should pursue those rewards. Right? We want to be judged well. We want to hear... Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come into the joy of your master. Take your rewards. There's plenty because you were faithful. I think we should probably think about the coming judgment more. What Christ will say to us. And when we, when we do that, maybe it'll change the way that we live today or tomorrow. And the way that we change people. I mean, the way that we treat people. Um, this can seem a little, this can seem a little oppressing. I just want to comment here again on this little phrase, the law of liberty. Uh, James used it um, in chapter 1, verse 25. He said the perfect law, the law of liberty. But he says it again here, and he's trying to emphasize that the law of Christ, when we're in Christ, the law, uh, Christ commands the word of God. It is not restricting to us, right? He doesn't call it the, the law of slavery and bondage. It's the law of liberty. You are freed to obedience. That's what James is saying. If it feels binding to you to, oh, I have to live for Christ's reward. How, how am I going to live to please Christ? The standards are so high. Yeah, they are. They are high. But Christ lived life for you. And he lives life in you by his Spirit. You have the power, not because of yourself and not within yourself, but because of Him and within His, within His Spirit within you, you have the power to obey. And that is liberating, freeing. Galatians says, for freedom Christ has set us free. We are free in Christ. And His commandments are not a burden to our sinful selves anymore because he has set us free from sin. Romans talks about how we were once slaves of sin and we become slaves of righteousness. You're thinking, well, both are slavery. Yeah, but one is real slavery. Slavery to sin, that's true slavery. The other one, you are enslaved, but that enslavement is total freedom. You're restored to how God intended it from the Garden of Eden. To live with him to enjoy Him and to obey Him forever. It is a law of liberty in Christ Jesus. Being in Christ changes everything. Totally changes everything. We have the freedom and the power because of Christ to obey and for Him to be pleased with us, pleased with us at the end of time with our good deeds. They actually count something now because we're in Christ. It's incredible. Incredible. Praise God for the law of liberty. Verse 13, James says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Basically what he's saying, if you don't show mercy, you won't receive mercy. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. James kind of gives us the antithesis of, this, of that Beatitude. He gives us the opposite of it. And he just says, uh, Cursed are the non-merciful, for they will not receive mercy. That's basically what he says here. For judgment is without mercy. You will not find mercy in the judgment if you don't show mercy on earth. Because that, that evidence, the, the mercy of God hasn't even gripped you. 
Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and keep oneself in stain from the world. How do you know that the mercy of God has reached your soul? How do you treat people? Do you visit orphans and widows? Do you care for them? Do you show impartiality? That's a, that's a really big evidence whether or not the mercy of God has reached our hearts. How do I treat people? For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is a reference to God's mercy, I think, and to our mercy. God's mercy triumphs over his judgment on us because of Christ. And because, uh, because we have received from God a triumphing mercy, we ought to show a triumphing mercy to others. Our mercy it comes from God goes through us, out to others, and it should triumph over our judgment upon others. Right? So, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Christian impartiality. Not showing favoritism to people based on outward appearance, based on degrees, based on wealth, based on their breath, and don't get me wrong, brush your teeth, but don't don't make it too hard for people to not show impartiality. But but things on the outside, some people look meaner than other people, right? My dad looks like a mean guy. Some people show him show partiality towards him because of it. If we're just being honest, we shouldn't do that. It's a it's a fight. It's a battle to not do this, but it's what we're called to do. And that's why I said, if you struggle with this, hey, we're here for you. This is, this is what church is for. We want to be like James and say, don't do that. Don't do that, my brother, my sister. I'm here for you till the end, and I will be in the doldrums with you and fight, but don't do it. <laughs> that's what the church does. I mean, we love one another by telling one another a lot, hey, don't do that. You say, well, that's kind of hard. Well, I'm here for you. I struggle with it too, but it doesn't mean that it makes it okay. That's what James is telling us. That's what James is telling us. Uh, we're here for each other. That's the church. Um, so I know this is a, a really timely passage, um, but just remember... Get back to the Word of God. God dictates our conduct in the church. We, we don't want to become so swayed one direction or the other just because of the tide of the culture. We want to be steady, right, in the Word of God, doing what we've been called to do because it's God who called us to do it. All right, peace out, people. Uh, study the Word this week. Love you all.